Welcome to Rubonas podcast. I'm the host, Donatas Rubonas. This is Augustus Šlodauskas. And we're missing Gritis Višnauskas because he's now on FIFA window. He cannot play both games. And unfortunately, he was called up by by the football teams. He can, because yesterday he was also, uh, he was commenting first the World Cup game, and then I tuned in the NBA Evening game. Uh, it was, but it was only one game. Not today. New, New there's York like Phoenix four and he games. He was commenting that as well. Today we're three, three games. Mm -hmm. Okay, but anyways, I mean his schedule will be pretty intense, so it's going to be tough to have him on our bonus podcast for the upcoming few weeks. Are we doing a Q and A session this week? We should do it. Should do it, yeah. but uh, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see because Ritis Ritis is questionable for the Q and A session. Please come back soon. I want to talk uh, football at, at least a little bit, at least five minutes before the pod. <laughs> There's no reason to talk about football. Just watch FIFA Uncovered and you'll see that, you know, it's just a big uh, money washing machine. Okay, but uh, I'm just, just watching the games and just uh, at least uh, commenting the, the best plays and just talking a little bit about it. Man, it was, I watched that documentary flying to Istanbul last week and then on my return flight, and I really, okay, I wasn't about to watch the World Cup uh, this year, this winter, but I really had another legal, let's say, reason just to skip this World Cup, mm. just because I'm boycotting, his, you know, this Qatar event as the host of the football event. So you're not going to watch it at all? Probably not. You're going to support. You're going to support that's it, Italy. That, Ita Italy that's not playing in it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was about to support Italy that's not playing. Ten minutes before but the pod, it doesn't he say he anything. Me, <laughs> it doesn't say anything. Ten minutes before the pod, Donatas asked me why I said I'm going to support England <laughs> as I always do, and he's like, "Not Italy," and I'm like, "Italy is not playing there," and he's like, "Oh, really?" Yeah, yeah. I thought that Alessandro Del Piero and. <laughs> Uh, John Luigi Buffon will do yeah. everything in their power. And you know. Francesco Totti scoring Francesco goals. Francesco Totti <laughs> off the bench. Mario Bolatelli also. I mean, that, that was an amazing roster. And, you know, that's a huge blow. Uh, huge blow that I won't <laughs> be watching the FIFA World Cup. This is why the podcast is about uh, basketball. basketball. <laughs> thank God, thank God. Although in this pod, we will have some stuff to discuss, which is, let's say, more off the floor stuff, right? Yeah. We had a lot of games last week, but we will focus more on some other stuff. And of course, another left is Barca game, uh, Milan signing Timotej Lubavu Kabaro, Dusko Ivanovic uh, starting his military camp in Belgrade. <laughs> and we will share our, let's say, first MVP ladder of the season, yeah. something like that. But I believe we'll have some other topics sure. coming out of, of that but you, ha you had a nice trip i mean you were in istanbul last week and uh i mean barcelona fs game was probably the most interesting with on the court stuff and off the court stuff it, it was just so much uh i mean let's say content i don't know there's so many things to talk about from because that from that game i think that quality wise the game itself wasn't that good but why not? I mean, offensively, it was nice to see. I mean, there were some moments, uh, especially in the second half, where the teams were just making shot after shot. You know, La Provitola, uh, uh, Will Clyburn was in, a, in a, some kind of zone for like two or three minutes, just making all the hard shots. So I, w I, w I was like, for me, it was a beautiful game to see. I, yeah. I, I enjoyed it. I saw a different FS as well. That's true. That's true. And I think that different FS is also one of the reasons why Sharuna Sisikavich you know, went wild on the sidelines. Mm. Uh, just to remind the context, uh, after the game, he shook hands with Ergin, Ergin Ataman, but later he was like, uh, threw some remarks towards the rest of the coaching staff. And at least from what my sources told that, he said something like, oh, great fucking cameras. And it was related to him accusing FS on filming their practice uh, before the game. And maybe it was related to the fact that he saw some adjustments that FS team made in the game. I mean, they were uh, prepared, FS. Um, you could see that they were very early uh, with their passes, let's say, against some of uh, uh, Barca's defensive coverages. 
Uh, Barca was in the first half was playing a very uh, extremely aggressive defense on the point guards, you know, on Mitic, on the ball handlers, like like Barca usually do, because Charles is the one who thinks, okay, uh, usually against great point guards, great uh, scorers, I play aggressive defense, so I force them to you know pass out the ball and let others do the play. So they were uh, they need help from that from the low mans and and uh, help side. And uh, what the ball handlers did, they were just uh, throwing the ball away uh, very early, and that created a lot of open shots. And, um, I mean, Barcelona didn't do anything to prevent those shots. I mean, they weren't aggressive on the ball as much to not let these passes go so easily. And um, maybe, I mean, we don't know what really happened if they really filmed the practice. This is not the first time Charas uh, has some similar type of remark mm. but uh maybe Sharas seeing how fs uh you know were prepared for basically hedge defense for uh, weak defense for for these defensive purposes and like passing the ball so early so 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 good which is not usually what fs does uh maybe that forced him into thinking that you know they were prepared because they saw some someone but i mean at the same time it's uh, the same you know, usually these cho- this is what Charles chooses to, choose to do against uh, such uh, players like Mitic or Clyburn playing the pick and roll. Yeah, and first of all, this is very serious accusation. We're talking about Extremely. one of the best EuroLeague coaches accusing back-to-back champs filming the practice. That's huge. I cannot imagine this in the NBA, for example. If that happened, I mean, it would, it would went viral, really. Mm-hmm. And I would definitely see Adam Silver or whoever uh, addressing the issue like the following day in the press conference where like three days, more than three days uh, since that game happened, we didn't see any statement by the yearly head coaches board. We didn't see any statement by the yearly mm-hmm. organization. We didn't see any statement from anybody except from Ergin Ataman, you know, making yeah. some strong remarks because no, I think that if you come out with that kind of stuff even on a sidelines uh, scuffle you should have some not just some some not some but real real proof whether it's mm-hmm. like video uh some video footage or like photo because um i was following jalgiris uh, to yearly away games for a couple uh, seasons and i remember there were at least two occasions first in valencia tel aviv one as well. there was a tel aviv probably the let's say with the loudest uh um, how to say sequences uh, because Nevin Spahia was also involved in that uh, mm-hmm. altercation with Sharas. It was, of course, a verbal altercation behind the scenes in the tunnel uh, next to the press conference. Uh, but what happened with Valencia, I know for sure the Jaligada staff found some camera uh, on top of the stands, which was, you know, just directed like in the middle of the floor. And there was the whole the whole floor on camera, and it was recording. And from what I know, Jargis found that found that out. They stopped the video, they deleted the record, and you know, it was just that. So Sharas has some experience, and I can kind of understand his frustration coming out of it because of some last experiences. But in this case, from at least from what I heard, they don't have that kind of proof. It could have been that the, he saw some cameras like this directed into the mm. court when he saw some adjustments on the court and maybe he thought that, you know, it was something not good going on. But that's just scenes. But that's just temper then. E- exactly, I mean. exactly. As I said, you have to have some real proof coming with these mm. uh, accus- coming, accusing back-to-back champs. So... I don't know. I don't know if I really didn't like it, uh, especially because if he even had something, you should come out with it before the game. You have a lot of time. And what it That's al- true. That's what true. also makes uh, it a bit unlikely that FS were filming uh, the practice session is that Bars arrived to Istanbul late on Wednesday, I think. The game was on Thursday. They didn't have... Uh, Wednesday practice in Istanbul because they just arrived uh, arrived at uh, something like 9.30 in the hotel. Mm-hmm. So they went to sleep and they had just morning practice. Usually it's a shoot around. 
I mean, it's a short practice. Exactly, short practice. You cannot do anything which you know will make you, let's say, scouted later uh, in, mm. in in the game. I mean, usually, yes, you m might uh, try to remember some things that you were talking yeah. in the day before, but nothing too too serious. You're not, you know, playing there. You're not trying anything new. Maybe you know some out of time out special plays that you want to implement in this game. Maybe try something new, but. It's usually a 40, 45, one hour, one hour long shoot around. And uh, yeah, I don't think, I don't think, uh, you know, FS would do, would do such thing. Yeah. The thing is that, yes, FS had a different preparation for this game than for any other game before. They started the season two and a five. Uh, they were on three game losing streak. The game was not clicking, even though, of course, Shane Larkin is not player. But there was some, let's say, unhappiness inside the team uh, coming to that game. So they wanted to change some uh, some things. They had, uh, let's say, players meetings uh, where they had to emphasize some stuff to new players to be on the same page. They had some tactical uh, adjustments. And that was just a normal uh, situation for a losing team, for a, let's say, high, highly valid back-to-back <laughs> -back champion team, which wanted to see some difference on the core. And that's that's what happened. I really, I mean, I would love to support Truna Siskavich. He's from Lithuania. I, I really like his ideas. I mean, he was a big inspiration uh, for me, the way how you can see the basketball. But at the same time, if you don't have any real proof and you come out with these kind of accusations straight after the game, you're kind of, you know, ironically shout at the assistant coach of the team, which was Tomislav Mijatovic. And from what some, let's say, FS people told me that this is the last guy who will go in any kind of altercation. Mm. He's just, you know, let's say, low-grounded guy who is just doing his job and he's polite and he's not, you know, going to get into any kind of fight. So it also tells us a lot, uh, you know, what, what it means to FS. Because, yeah, there's another important thing. Sometimes you hear, you hear things about some specific teams, about some specific coaches that they might do some stuff. Uh, <laughs> and there are some... Suspicious that had some ground be mm. behind it. And I remember that I think that even Jesse Cavage has played for some coaches like Zmago Sagadin, uh, which were known as somebody who were spying. And I remember that I don't say, I don't remember the clear stories, but these teams, they're kind, some, you know, kind of uh, caught by filming practices. Maybe somebody was doing some silly stuff on the court or or even Jelko Bradovic or somebody called out Zmago Sagadin for, for filming the stuff. Anyways, I mean, Sharas had that kind of experience. There are some coaches who are known for doing these dirty things, but I talked with a lot of different people. They never heard anything like that about FS. So I just don't see that happening, happening in this particular game mm. against Barcelona. And... Uh what would uh, you know? What should be the response from the Euroleague? I mean, if if we are getting to this conclusion that it was just uh, you know what Shara saw from the game, and uh, it was mainly based on his previous experiences, and maybe you know he lost the game. Uh, there was a lot of tension. You know, there was this situation with Nikola Kalinic. You're losing the game. You're losing to the defending champions. It's kind of a of a statement game, you know, during the regular the regular season. I mean, from my point of view, it mattered more than any other game. A little bit more, you know, for mm -hmm. both teams. Mm -hmm. You know, FS was struggling for Barcelona. You know, they lost in the in the, in the final uh, two years ago, yeah. and um, so it just you want to win this game more, a little bit more, just a little bit more than 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 any any, any other game. So losing that might have influenced, you know, his. You know this this uh, phrase af immediately after the game, but what should be the response or what should be uh, should Charas come out and you know deny you know if if he was if he was really just it was a temper thing should he come out and say something you know apologize or uh, should the Euroleague do something about it or you know what would you expect or just just say say nothing do nothing and. Uh, this situation goes away because uh, there is not a lot of coverage from uh, uh, from the media for Euroleague basketball. That's a that's a good question. I think that Sharas also should considering should consider apologizing FS and just Euroleague fans in general because it it raises questions about the transparency of the game. 
which is really important. And uh, if he didn't have some real proofs, if some kind of... I mean, it's hard to get proof, you know? I, I imagine it's hard to get proof. I mean... As I said, I mean, he's, in that, he's for a, example, in that particular Val Valencia case, you just could have some, you know, you could record having oh, a camera some, in front of the floor. recording uh, the camera in yeah. the court that's recording. Yeah. I mean, it's at least something. You have to have something. And I mean... He, he he should apologize if there are no clear proofs. And if, for example, Euroleague did their investigation, talking with the Euroleague TV crew, because from what I heard that uh, people from TV had to, you know, they were involved in, the, in that situation. They were asked for some information, what happened, you know, before that game, because usually they put all the cameras, they do all the setup for the game mm. uh, many hours before the match. And since it was the game day, you know, they could have, had some 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 information but i mean there there should be some kind of investigation there should be something uh, coming out uh, from the euro league as a statement and what i just didn't like that much which i kind of understand but at the same time i believe that transparency is important and i asked this question to dimitris Itudis after the fenerbahce panathinaikos game Itudis is the president of euro, euro league head coaches board but he repeated twice or even three times that this is something which they will mm, discuss inside their house. I mean, mm. they don't want to, any kind of information to go on public. But in this case, when you make these accusations, when even Coach Ataman already made these remarks that, okay, Sharas, you should resign uh, from this coach's board, or if you will prove that we were spying you, I will resign as the head coach of Anadol Efes. I mean, it's already a big statement. It's already a big, big stuff. So you, you expect some kind of response as well in, in public. I expect some transparency mm. because this is already not inside the house. This is this is on public already. So you have mm. to address these things and issues uh, in public. I agree. Should we move on to the game at least? Uh, I mean, I have another so. another thing which is also related to the game. What also could have caused this situation on the sidelines uh, and sparked Sharuna Sesikavich's anger at some outside the court stuff that. He was already it, what what is interesting that from from this Itodi statement as well. In his response, it was like a five minute response starting how he created the Euroleague. <laughs> uh, not he created, but how how Euroleague head coaches is doing great job. You know what okay. what coaches they are taking care of. Typically to the situation, which is okay, really, because it was a good way and platform. Let's see, not to promote, but to explain what they do. Uh, Where this uh, when this to this interview will be out. It was already out on Friday night, I think, oh, okay. straight after the game. But, uh, okay, okay. but he hinted that this is sports and emotions is part of the sports. So uh, he's, he emphasized that I'm not going to do any conclusions. I didn't talk to both coaches and I didn't see any kind of you know, stuff uh, to have more information. But he mentioned something about emotions. And I f think that, you know, Sharas, he was just affected by emotions because his team was underperforming. Uh, he just sent off Nikola Kalinic to the locker room, mm. who was one of the best players, uh, you know, uh, on the floor. Yeah, yeah. You, could say, you could say he was the best for Barcelona. Yeah, and, you know, he was playing against FS. And as you mentioned, it's, it's just a... It's not a regular game on their calendar because it's Yesikavich or Zataman because you're facing your league champions. And since Sharas and Jelko, they are really close, I mean that, I, I believe that this game really uh, matters him more than some, some other games. Mm -hmm. So maybe, you know, he was just affected by a lot of negative factors which came to one point and he made this, you know, accusation. Uh, Brian Dunstan said uh, that... Uh the, these all conversations and it wasn't about we were disappointed not about uh you know our energy our energy was okay but then he went on uh and and said we needed to change something you know and uh, so he was like basically dec declining uh, the statement that fs lacked energy but then he said it wasn't about the tactics or something that we changed during this game you know during fs barcelona so he was like contradicting what what he said oh, it himself. was a post game Euroleague tv uh i i just read your article that ah. uh, that was out today on uh -huh. uh, on basketnews.com and uh to me like you can say whatever you want that fs uh you know fs problem wasn't energy but to me, after seeing this game, was so sure that it was all about the 
you know, dedication, the, you know, intensity, what you, what you bring to the game. FS were, for the first time this season, they were playing like the game mattered to them for the first time this season, really. Uh, I watched almost all uh, FS games th this year and this was something more to them. And uh, you could you could uh, you could tell that from you know how they were helping on defense, like a math MBA getting three blocks. Even f I, mean, I I I don't know. I saw three or f he was four three in the uh, uh, box score, but mm -hmm. he has one more amazing. He had one more amazing help, and yeah. um, you know just how attached they they were to Barcelona players. Um, it was it was a different me, ball game for really. me. It was it was this thing that uh, that was that was the changing. It it wasn't that much more in the tactics. I mean, yeah, Will Clyburn didn't start the game. I was I was asking myself why, and um, probably you know my answer would be because uh, Ataman wanted uh, Clyburn to play against Alex Brines and not against Nikola Kalinic at the start because when Kalinic went to the bench, uh, you know, Clyburn was playing in the first half a lot of minutes against uh, Alex Abrina, so it's kind of a bigger advantage than against uh, Kalinic, who is a better defender on the post. So you could see some, you know, adjustments being made from Ataman, but uh, the bi the biggest one was for sure the intensity. Yeah, <laughs> but it was funny also that the moment Sharas uh, sent off Nikola Kalinic, Will Clyburn just exploded. He started the fourth quarter. I mean, uh, he started the fourth quarter by scoring 10 consecutive points. He scored 18 points in the entire fourth quarter. That was a game changer. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we have to admit that, I mean, Alex Abrinas wasn't playing his best game, all around game. I would say he was missing some, some good shots. Defensively, in my eyes, he was allow allowing Will Clyburn too much. And, you know, it just. It was just a very, very bad day for Shogun Sisikaev just because by... Okay, I mean, there is some kind of set of rules how you should act in a team environment. And, and if Nikola Kalinic did something wrong, that's bad. From what I remember, I think that this moment wasn't on cameras when he decided, you know, to set him uh, off the bench. It, it, it happened like twice because he was... Uh, oh, it was on TV? On TV, it was like, uh, you know, uh, Sharas gets Rakas from the bench. Shara says, says Rockus to go up and, and uh, change someone on the court. Mm -hmm. And uh, immediately he turns back around again and he's like, uh, you know, points to Nikola Kalinic and, and says, you are out, like, go, go out. So, and it didn't happen. Like, it, it's, it's something maybe, uh, he, like, from what we saw on the, on the TV, was like Kalinic said something about uh, Shara's decision to play to put Rockus uh, on the court. Uh, it, it all started actually from the timeout. Uh, there was a situation where Vasa Mitic scored a layup with three minutes to play in the end of the third quarter. And I think that Sharas didn't like the way Kalinic played his you know, help role inside the paint because mm. Mitic penetrated from the perimeter. And I think that Kalinic should have been uh, inside. So he was late and Mitic scored the layup. Mm -hmm. And the timeout started. Sharas took a timeout and he started you know, shouting at Kalinic. And I think that he responded. Maybe in some way, you know, we shouldn't respond to your head coach. And it was almost instant, <laughs> get out of the court. And Kalinic at first, I think, as I remember, uh, he was a bit surprised. He uh, he sat there. He remained on the bench. That's the funny thing. He wanted to leave. He was already on his way to the tunnel. But then Carter Higgins stepped up and he said, "Hey, man, just sit down. Don't go out. Just just still be you know be there. Okay. Maybe you know Sharas." He was, you know, out of emotions, and maybe he was too emotional about that, and maybe he would have changed his mind. So Kalinic decided to sit on the bench. The timeout was over. Other players stepped on the court. You know, the game continued. And two minutes later, I see Sharas coming to the end of the bench, and it felt like whether he just noticed that Kalinic was still on the bench, or <laughs> he kind of had this short two-minute discussion, should I send him uh, to the locker room or not, because... Of course, if you're saying that, A, you're out and the player is on the bench, that kind of questions the authority of the head coach. I mean, for the other player, you might see, you know, that happening and you might think that, okay, if he will say for me to go out and I won't, maybe nothing happens. So maybe Sharas had to follow his line 
and finally set him off. So that's when he said, "Hey, man, what, what you're doing here? Just, just, just oh, yeah. go away." Be because uh, he asked Rokas to come in, and he was they were sitting next to each other. Mm -hmm. Could be, could be. And Maybe that so was the moment when he saw that he was still there. Mm -hmm. could, so, I mean, it, and then you know, Kalinic still was a little bit surprised, but he had to leave. And are you uh, are you upset that you had an interview with Nikola Kalinic one day before the game and not one day after? But probably the, he, he bit, wouldn't have... <laughs> that's what happened with Sharas. I mean... Given the interview after the game. I thought that if Barca wins, I, I was like, that's amazing. It's going to be his 200... I mean, it, it was his 200th game on uh, mm. Barcelona uh, team as the head coach, uh, combining, of course, EuroLeague, ACB, Cup games, uh, whatever. And I thought that it will be a nice, you know, checkpoint to see his career in Barca and to discuss some things to talk about his future. And then when I saw, you know, that happening, them then losing and having this altercation on the sidelines, I was quite sure that our interview, you know, is very questionable. And of course, Charles said that, hey man, I just said, what probably I had to say in the press conference, there's not nothing else to be said. So I I missed that opportunity. And the funny part is that before that game, I, I said to Nicola, like, man, I believe that you're a super important player for Sharas because he loves small forwards who can post up, who can play both positions, who can play all around game. If you remember Lanovas, he was great. Maybe you're even advanced uh, version of Edgar Lanovas and very important puzzle and championship. Yeah. Mm. Team, so yeah, that interview didn't get uh, as you did get it, didn't get interviews, didn't get FS. aged very well, yeah. And but we already talked about it. Uh, what did you want to add? I wanted to add about uh, Thomas Satoransky's performance, okay, and n not like you know, offensively, he finished the game with uh, he played 17 minutes, he scored uh, three points, four assists, two turnovers, not not impacting the game a lot, but. To me, it was uh, not only for him, but just these little defensive mistakes, little defensive details that Sharas emphasizes uh, a lot, uh, like you know, allowing Will Clyburn to drive right. You know that that all sequence that you told about Will uh, scoring a lot of points in the second half started from uh, Satoransky allowing Will Clyburn to drive right, and mm -hmm. you could just see Sharas immediately. You know, he's usually st uh, yeah. standing next to the next to the line to the sideline and after that uh, situation happens he's just like you know going to the bench and doing this you know just to his assistance and uh these little things you know you allow you are allow will Clyburn to drive right you allow him to score two points from from a layup and then and then it's over you know he's after that he's feeling it he's making tough shots you, you see step backs three pointers mid-range he was doing he was doing basically everything so um I don't know. It's uh, Vesely and Satoransky uh, are not playing as big of a role as they were uh, supposed to before the season. That's the problem I wanted to address. I know that this Vesely had some early foul trouble, and I think that maybe he put him out of the court because he was a little bit overreacting to some calls, which I kind of get it because I think that. There was this, you know, big highlight when Mbaya blocked Vesely, but I think that it was a clear foul because when he blocked, I mean, Vesely was about to dunk the ball and put Mbaya yeah. on the poster. And I think it was a clear foul because it was like this. I mean, mm. it, it really hit his wrist and it was an uncalled foul. Later, you remember that three-pointer by Misic, it was a clear, that was clean a clear block, block. Clean block. So I kind of get it that Vesely was frustrated, but at the same time... And he got a technical for that. Yeah. Which was a fourth foul. Yeah. But at the same time, you're on such a high level that you should control your emotions. And and it's just a slight part behind his game. Mm. But the thing I wanted to say is that you have Satransky playing 17 minutes, no matter how he plays. You have Vesely playing seven minutes, 24 minutes combined in one of the biggest games of the season so far against the Euroleague champs. And we're talking about the two or three uh, highest paid players of your team. Mm. I don't like to see that. I mean, if I'm paying, I mean, I like FS example, Vasilya Misic and <laughs> Will Clyburn, they lead the EuroLeague in minutes but played. They, but they're delivering. And they're delivering, that's true. But And they don't have really, you know, other guys guys to play. But they, I don't they're, uh, they're uh, FS 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th player are, it, aren't that good as Barcelona. It's good know? that Sartac Lee did a great job, you know, stretching the floor, but at the same time, 
I don't think that Mike Toby had a great game. Oscar De Silva had a terrible game. I don't game. think that Oscar De Silva terrible, was really terrible good. Terrible nine minutes. You're playing Vesely for like six minutes. Satransky, I think that he lacked of confidence. He couldn't play defense. It was bad game in general. But when I'm mm. talking that, just looking at the building the roster, I mean, you cannot put yourself in a situation where you're two of the high, highest paid players play s- such a limited time. It doesn't, it doesn't say a lot of good things about the way you build the roster or where you spend the most money. I think that that's the problem. Of course, we're talking about the one game. Of course, we're talking about the player who changed the team for the first time after how many, like eight years. I mean, Jan Vesely coming from, from Fenerbahce. Uh, I know that we're talking about Satoransky who just returned to Europe and he still needs some time to ad- adapt and then mm-hmm. to adjust in, in Shara system. But this is just bad. I mean, you're playing with some role players with all the respect they were signed some of the players who who played the last minutes in the game they were signed to play some roles and now you're facing your league champs uh playing with some great adjustments energy wise uh, first and foremost and you know it's it's is the battle you cannot win with that roster i just want to see how they you know when miro gets back you yeah. can see the real face of uh, of barcelona it- and uh I think that this game doesn't say a lot of bad things about Barca season in general. I think prior to this game, they were in a great situation. I mean, they're still playing without Nikola Mirotic. They're still playing with some players who need time to learn, time time to adapt. And they already beat some really solid teams and Barca was just dominating. Um, I think that this game was just more about uh, FS. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. FS were in, in more of a, you know need to to finally win i mean they were they had two wins after seven games and uh you know when you when you win two games the team's morale can can be that high so they needed this game more and uh barca is five and three without miro uh playing you know zero games uh i wouldn't make too big of a mess from this Mm -hmm. and, and just see you know how things go you know because it's important they get the home court advantage and now they are in fourth and sixth place so all is good. Should we jump to different topics? <laughs> Can we say that all is good in Milan? I know that we already discussed um, their situation and we thought that you cannot see worse game than that against Bologna. Uh, then we saw another loss for Milan now in Konas. The first half was just uh, the continuation of that game, uh, Virtus Olymp- Olympia. And uh, I mean, there isn't much there to say. Uh, Jalgir said we are going to attack Kevin Pangos on defense and Keenan Evans delivered uh, Jalgir said we are going to attack Kevin Pangos on pick and roll defense so he passes out uh, to Kyle Hines and Kyle Hines passes it out to the corners and they were getting open shots but uh, I don't know what kind of uh, virus is there on that team but nobody seems to be able to make a shot even an open shot mm-hmm. and uh, they are so bad on catch and shoot opportunities uh, that's you don't really even know what to say you know yeah. how you who can to blame I mean I, I, I don't know who to blame I mean you know the team's psychology uh, Devon Hall seems like you know he doesn't even want to shoot some of these open shots he was 10 from 50 uh, from the field coming into the game he shot uh, two of 11, I think, uh, or something like that. Mm. Uh, so, and you know, he's still playing uh, 30 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes, because simply they have four players that are injured. And, um, you know, if if you, are, if you are playing Milano right now, you should be happy. Like, mm. uh, these are probably the, they're still great defensively. They're, st- they're still good, but teams have found a weakness in Kevin Pangos. And, uh, you know, so I don't really see... I mean, uh, they signed Luavo Cabarro. He is good at, you know, finishing this... Uh, finishing from what the, his teammates have created, you know. So this is what Milano needs. But Milano also needs, n- needs something to create more of these shots because simply now their teams are attacking aggressively Pangos and it's you see Brandon Davies you see Nicolo Melli you see Kyle Hines trying to create situations from from others and uh, uh, Devon Hall 
you know he shouldn't be playing 25 minutes right now until he gets it he gets it going you you simply need i would say they needed more of a scorer uh more of a creator type who could just get inside the paint because they're not Kevin Pangos or Devin Hall are not doing that enough at, at the moment and uh but at the same time they needed just to add someone because they have so many injuries but do you think that um mm, Cabral will improve their shooting or their efficiency in catch and shoot situations I think so I mean he was free and D profile player in yeah. the NBA so so But for me he kind of fit that uh you know in that position he he really fits their physicality the yeah. small ball they can play yeah. I mean he's lengthy defender and he <laughs> play and defend multiple positions there now you see lineups with uh, they're playing with free bigs they're playing with you know Deshaun Thomas at the free or they're playing with Gianpaolo Ricci at the free uh so if you put uh, Luau Cabrera out there you get more uh just in my eyes more efficient offense and just a fresh face that is not bugged by the lack of confidence in that team because it seems like uh the last four games in the Euroleague where everyone has missed uh three pointers except Nazmi Trulong like he's the guy who should play the most minutes right now there yeah he's the only guy on that team that who's not afraid to shoot he's, he's not afraid shots. he's he, you look you see how yeah. he shoots you see the fluidity in the moves he's he you know his body speaks confidence to me Mm. And that one, that one, Hall, Kevin Pangos, does not show that at all. Mm. So it was, um, it was a really good move. Uh, not say not a good move, but just great for Schalgers that he got into an early foul trouble. So I think he played like three minutes in or four minutes in mm. the first half, and they just suffered. And then he he was the only you know piece of uh, spark spark uh, to that team in the second half because. He just created, you know, some step back three, some one on one against Lucas Lekavić, yeah. who is much smaller. Uh, so it was easy for Nazmi Trulong to do that. But without him, it was just painful to watch, man. Again, mm. for the third or fourth time in a row. Yeah, you know, just speaking of this confidence thing, I just remember these pictures of the Eurobasket, for example, where Luka Doncic was just turning his back on Timothy Lubavu Cabro, three pointer. So and he was of course missing them. And I mean you can you can say you can't say that he was very efficient scorer. He was averaging only five points in 17 minutes. Okay, his three point shooting was a solid solid forty-two uh, percent, but his but two this point is field in goals, basket. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's you know even in the BA, I mean, the yeah, last but, but years we are talking about yearly. We are talking about a lower level than than you know than NBA. But uh, in um, NBA, uh, as a spot up shooter, I think that he was just getting more open shots, uh, mostly co coming you know from his teammates, whether it was Atlanta or Brooklyn. Sure, and, and he was, he is not going to be asked here in Milano to create. No, no, uh, no. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I'm I'm just not sure. If he is that reliable, even as a spot up shooter mm. in this team, which is already lacking of confidence, because and as you said, I mean, okay. they they kind of create many open shots. They're just not making. It. I'm just, I don't know. In this situation, I was just expecting different kind of signing. But maybe we'll it's see. maybe it's coming. You know, maybe it's coming in the next few days. And uh, I don't know if you know anything. If they're talking with someone, but in my eyes, they need. S at first Billy they... Barron is supposed to come back on Sunday yeah. I guess so maybe they are waiting on him because a lot of offense when he's on the court a lot of offense goes through him mm -hmm. uh off ball sets so that changes a little bit Milano's offense because right now at the moment it's simply pick and roll and pick and pop and and that's it mm. and creativity but uh and improvisation but if you you can't if you don't have confidence it, it can be a formula of success mm. i don't think that they need to sign anybody else i mean they still mm. just need to wait for some players to recover and to join the lineup uh and most of these players they can shoot they're decent shooters so i think that they will improve their numbers for sure because it's 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 impossible to be even to be worse than that i mean their offensive rating is the worst since Nicholas Stumra started his bbolitics.com <laughs> project actually shout out to Nicholas yeah i mean in the whole yearly history none really? ever 
None other EuroLeague wow. team had a what's worse the offensive what's, rating. What's the rating now? So far is 99.5. Other teams, of course, we're just having wow. eight games of the season. I mean, but eight games, it's... It's already some meaningful... You know, uh, yeah, Kevin meaningful Hall is number. 20, 21% from twos and threes. The good thing is that they're first in defense which is also very important. At least, you know. They're, <laughs> what's funny, they're worse than offense, of course, which is not surprising, but th to see this contrast is ridiculous, but there's some, you know, ground for some hope when the better better scorers, better shooters uh, returns, they will improve their game. And their situation kind of reminds me, yes, the Cavs to Charles in 18, uh, 2018 and 19 season. If you remember, I think that it was that year when they had this crazy losing streak. Of the nine games. Yeah, the problem was that they were mm. creating shots. Shadas was putting them in good situations to score. They just couldn't hit uh, those shots. And he was always, he tried to remain patient and he always just repeating that, hey, I believe in my system. We're doing a good job. We're just not making. And so when they started to make those shots, they suddenly became the playoff team. Mm. Uh, so maybe it's just a matter of breaking through this some unexplainable eyes because it's really hard to explain how Kevin Pangos, uh, you know, throws the air ball in a open situation, or Nicola Melli, Devon Hall, really good shooters, shoot good shooters. They're not making open shots. I want to see Kevin Pangos and uh, Nazmi Trulang playing together. If if Devon Hall continues to struggle and you don't mm -hmm. have Billy Barron for this week, uh, I know probably it's going to be a target defensively, yeah. but but Devon Hall playing thirty minutes. Um, with this shooting per percentages is just hard hard to see, you know. Uh, I know he will be better and he will be back in no time shooting shooting good, but just for now, it's he's in a big big shooting slump. Watching this roster and seeing Milan struggling, uh, I had this uh, out of the box idea. What if? I mean, you saw Ettore Messina press conference after the game in Konas. He didn't hide that the team is playing just depressing. I mean, the he was the very shit open. Reference. The shit reference was shit great. The, I mean, reference. It, the transparency level of Messina's speech, <laughs> speech was like an example. And Grande Ettore. let's say Ettore uh, sees himself as a problem uh, of you know this losing streak of, of this tough situation of the season mm. which i think it's too early to you know to, to, to judge and before the team starts you know i would understand if they wouldn't create those open shot opportunities now they're creating so let's let's be patient let's let's wait for for betting for this shooting slump to end but just let's say etra messina is tired of having this depression week by week and says hey i'm stepping down as the head coach but since he's the let's say head of president of basketball operations, he stays as the top guy in the front office, but he hires Pablo Lasso and this team. Mm. What would you think about that move? Because watching this roster, how deep they are, watching the level of this roster, it kind of feels that it's kind of, you know, Pablo Lasso team, I would say. I don't see that, I don't see that happening, but I would like that. Mm. It would make sense. Maybe it wouldn't uh, make sense from Metro Messina uh, no, standpoint. It, it, does, it doesn't yeah. make sense from uh, Messina's point of view, but uh, I would I would like to see that actually. That's that's a uh, I think they would be a really exciting team to watch, and since they have already a great um, let's say base for the defense, you know you can't really forget mm. that quickly. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What you have been taught for the last even for this three months of the season so for, for the new guys. So that, that would be an exciting uh, combo to see. Exactly. That would be an exciting combo. I agree. Exactly. Uh, we talked about Milano, but uh, I want to shout, to shout out Kazis Maxquides. Okay. I mean, who could have imagined Jalga is being five and three after, after eight games? Pro just, probably, yeah, the players are going, the, the Jalga players are saying, yeah, we could have imagined that. But uh, because you are on the team, you're supposed to believe. But, you know, just from outside of the team, uh, not a lot of uh, belief they could be that good. But um, they're proving that this model of building the team around, you know, uh, hungry, uh, defensive-minded uh, mm -hmm. players, uh, greedy, with some solid uh, creation ball handlers in, Ke in Keenan Evans, 
uh, you could have success. Obviously, they had a lot of luck in some in some of the games. You you mm. cannot you cannot say that they are now five and three without the luck. They yeah, they they had a lot of luck, and uh, I was asked uh, before the game, uh, "Do you think they are going to keep with a three point percentage as high as it is now?" And I said, "It's it's not possible." And during the game with Milan, they missed a lot of even good shots, open shots they had. And, uh, you know, I still think it, it, it's going to go down. Even, you know, Arnas Butkiewicz is hitting a uh, falling uh, from, the, from, the corner, from the corner of the, of the court, falling, to the, uh, falling out of bounds and still making that shot. There is something about Kazis Maxfidis and his teams. Like, mm. I don't know what it is, but I- is it the feel-good part, you know, that you have around him uh, when he is the coach? But... They like to play with each other. Uh, obviously, the the arena helps, uh, but they're just getting this, getting uh, luck when it's needed. They're not lucky all the game. They're just lucky that one moment when you need it the most, and they're really mm-hmm. solid defensively. So, you add this to the mix, and you are have you have Jalgiris that are in the playoffs at the moment, and not a lot of people expected that. Yeah, I mean, if if you don't understand what it means for Jalgiris to have on a five and three record, I mean, just look at the last season. The first time they reached five victory mark was February twenty fourth. Wow! So it's like three months, three months, three months away from from now. So that's that's a huge upgrade for the team, and I'm just happy for so the. Bad. I wanted to call him a rookie yearly coach. He had this yearly experience with Neptunas Klepada like seven years ago, seven eight years ago. But this is the new EuroLeague. This is way stronger EuroLeague. And he's winning against teams coached by Sharuna Sesikavichus, Sergio Scariolo, now Ettore Messina. He's winning against legendary coaches. And he did it with a great g- game plan, you know, against Olympia, as I said. You know, mm. attack Kevin Pangos defensively. Keenan Evans, whenever he had the opportunity. You, c- you could see that on the first play of the game, he attacked Kevin Pangos when he had the opportunity. There were two other moments where, you know, the... All the attention is on the on the side of the court. They were some playing some other sets. I don't remember exactly what was it, but mm. you know, all the attention is on the side. Keenan Evans is on the other side with the ball. He sees that every, not, not there is no help defense from Milano. He attacks Kevin Pangos. He scores. That's a great that's a great game planning from Maxfidis and the coaching staff. And then you know, just playing through the post. You know, Milano is going to switch, so you try to get Devon Hall against a taller, you know, Ulano was Brezdekis, uh, even Roland Schmitz posting against a smaller player of Milano, who is, you know, not named Nicola Melli. And they were getting getting good shots. Even that shot from Arnas Butkevich was from the corner. I think it was from a post-up play. And it was an em- emphasis, you know, on that game. So they are doing with a clear idea how to play and how to attack. So not only shout out to Max Quiris, but to all the coaching staff for a great job. Yeah. They're not very sexy. They could have been not five and three, but maybe three and five. But you remember that game against Virtus, Barcelona game. I mean, against Alba, they were losing by twenty. Yeah, the record could have been very different. But as mentioned, I mean, physicality, defensive-minded team, a good chemistry, uh, a lot of confidence. I would say that this team is really confident. Keenan Evans hitting this crazy. Three pointer over Kevin Pangos, if you remember, it was a nonsense shot. I mean, it was, it oh, was only was, uh, yeah, seven was... seconds in the shot clock, and he's just throwing that. I don't know. I I cannot explain that shot. He was but he uh, made it. He was a. Uh, I mean, he saw Kevin Pangos wanting. I think wanting to foul. Uh, I don't know. No, he that was, was just for sure. A, that was for he sure. He was just aggressive in, defensively. Yeah, and Keenan Evans, Keenan Evans thought I'm going to get to the free throw line, uh. and I'm going to shoot it, and it's going to be a shooting foul, and I'm going to get to to have three free throws. Instead, he just made the shot, and they didn't call a foul, mm. which was strange. It was just a strange possession in general. Uh, but anyway, it's it's great to see Jalik is winning. Of course, I I also, you know, rely this idea of watching at standings, or at least at least when standings really matter is maybe it's just from January or February. We already had some examples. You can see where Alba Berlin is right now. We were so hyped about their start of the season, but this they doesn't were playing really... better. They were playing better with... Uh, uh, <laughs> Without uh, four key yeah. players, basically. 
Yeah, so let's be patient whether your team is winning or losing because sure. we're just eight games into the season. But talking, speaking of patience, <laughs> how patience you uh, you need to have uh, with Dusko Ivanovic as your head coach. I mean, that that information coming from Serbian media went viral. I, th I think that the first report was that Dusko Ivanovic had five-hour practice, right? Yeah, but then a lot of people were saying that it was only the practice was two an hour and a half. Dusko said it was six and a half, but of course Dushka that was, was a joke. Dusko was yeah, Dusko was clowning. I think, <laughs> you know, the the media and uh, I mean, I don't know. You know, he he just wants. Uh, okay, so my 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 thoughts on this. He wants to see from the team who is willing to go to war to war with him, who is willing to be tough, and he's also setting the tone for this team that we have to work if we want to win. Uh, I, you know, just watching uh, Zvezda with uh, Jovanovic, they were not that bought into the game. Mm, they were not as aggressive as Zvezda should be. Uh, I, I know they have some players that are not defensive-minded like they were last season, but they don't have that much star power to win games by playing offense. And see, seeing them not giving 100% defensively was weird. And I think that, you know, with these practices, with this approach to the players, you know, and why they made this change is because they want uh, someone who can bring, who can bring, you know, toughness to the team and who can have the players accountable. Uh, because I just, I just didn't see that from, from the mm. players before. So... Five-hour practices sounds strange, even though it was probably all the time spent in the arena. Exactly, it wasn't. It wasn't five hours of you know playing five on five on the court. That would be crazy. It draw a lot of reactions. Uh, <laughs> one of the funniest tweet was, of course, by the MVP of of Euroleague Twitter, Mike James, Mr. Natural, <laughs> and uh, we tweeted that Dusko Ivanovic effect training on Tuesday lasted from five to to ten. And he he just tweeted that I would have walked out at seven thirty. Seven thirty, yeah. But of course, there were people like Nick Stauskas, for example, saying that Dusko Ivanovic is the head coach who took all the joy from playing basketball, and he's the main and his ideology, which still has a lot of fans in Europe, is one of the main reasons why he's not playing in in, in this continent. So uh, I kind of get it. I mean, if that was something you know out of proportions. Uh, Mm, let's say Dusko Ivanovic really having uh, a long practice. Mm -hmm. From from what I've heard, from what I've told, that if practices are over three hours, players can inform Euroleague Players Association. That's in the contract, and they right, send right? a report to Euroleague, and the club gets warning. If you know the next time the the clubs uh, the club is is, is fined. Uh, so it it seems like the real on court practice took two and a half hours, and you know I've. Well, the remaining part of this five-hour practice was like video reviews, warm-ups, recovery, probably because some running yeah. was mentioned there as well. Yeah, I, I just kind of practice. I mean, yeah, that's true. That's true. But I talked with some players, and they really said that their usual practice routine takes something around five hours. I mean, including the warm-up, including some extra shots or recovery, recovery and stuff, stuff like yeah. that. So this is nothing, you know, out of proportions. Uh, so yeah, Dushko, Dushko is good, but you know, I just didn't like this this idea that it was romantized by some some players. Like for example, uh, there was uh, Mirza Teletovic coming out and saying that oh, uh, it, it's true mm. that there are some players who can't play with Dushko. There are the ones who don't want to become legendary, don't want to work on themselves, and to be better today than yesterday. Those who aren't dedicated to basketball couldn't play with him. I mean. I, I who, who is this addressed to? Mm. Because somebody from the team got this information out. Mm -hmm. That that was my point as well. As, as I said, you know, he, he's he's testing the guys. I think, you know, it's the first no, week. I mean, this, he, this he, quote he, this he, this quote was by Mirza Teletovic. But before or after this happened? After it happened. Oh, okay. Which I don't like. I don't think that nowadays we still need to have this military approach. No, no, for sure, no. Uh, you know, I don't like, you know, romantizing that type of coaches. And if the guy, you know, doesn't feel like he should be, you know, practicing for five hours, which is already a lot. And I mean, 
the time, the length, the duration of the practice doesn't say a lot ab about the efficiency of the practice. Uh, so I'm not supporting these uh, dictatorships, uh, you know, on the sidelines. And uh, that's what I didn't like, you know, that there were some guys mm -hmm. who were romantizing this whole idea because uh, sometimes it's just out of proportions. And, you know, it should be some rules. And I like that Elpa has some rules. And since yeah. since Red Star, any of Red Star players, you know, they didn't uh, reach out to them, there was no reason to, to make any kind of report. So everything is good. And what I was also told that it's, it's usual in a situations where the team is having a new head coach. And since the EuroLeague schedule is really tough, there's just no time uh, to input some of their ideas. So the first yeah. couple of practice usually take longer than regularly for Every, example that's everywhere you know with dushko it coach. might be different you know he's that type of uh, coach you i think it's going to last all the season nah it's <laughs> it's not possible it's just not healthy for the players although nah, the dushko players know that they will have to run a lot of a lot of it's time be, the it's practice. gonna be probably different than it was before yeah but, I, I, but in, just in general i just want you know i would just, just want that there should be some rules in your league in general for example uh, sometimes it feels like the Euroleague is the is the Wild West. I mean, there's this financial fair play idea, but if you look at it, I mean, in some no of the top teams, play. I don't see a lot of fair play, and you just need to do some bigger research or you know investigation, and it turn it would turn out that you know it's 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 not working. Then there is this, you know, okay, this time I, I really thought that the practice took, took longer, but if it's like two, uh, two hours and a half, I mean, that's okay for the, for the first couple of, of practices. For example, I also faced the uh, uncomfortable situation where I went to Istanbul. I wanted to talk to Ergin Ataman, to FS players before the game against Barca. And it's like mandatory uh, in the EuroLeague to have pre-game media session for like 15 minutes of media coming to the pr end of the practice and, you know, just asking about the upcoming game mm. or, you know, anything what is important. And somehow, you know, there were some situations where I wasn't informed about the practice and it turned out there was no open media practice before FS game against Barca. So I, was, I wasn't able, you know, to make any kind of interview, which in the long term hurts the league this is one of the biggest games of the season you know so i just i just don't like it because in every situation there are some loopholes and it's it's, mm. it's not good for the euro league to, to grow like fs said that uh, we want to concentrate on the game uh so you know we are losing and we want mm. to concentrate on the game to play better to win i mean you giving the interview it shouldn't be you know, it shouldn't change the way you you yeah. play the game. I mean, it shouldn't be a hell it shouldn't of a be a game changer. It shouldn't be a distraction. You know, NBA players give interviews before the final. Uh, you know, during the NBA finals, every each day, every day before the game, after the game, and it's not a problem. And it doesn't. You know, they are not saying, "Oh, if I'm not giving this interview, I'm playing better tonight or tomorrow," because the the, the interviews were supposed to happen not on the. They uh, not on the um, the same day as the game, right? Yeah, the day before. Yeah, and NBA so that's players, like, for me, you that's can bullshit. get into the NBA team's locker room and make an interview before the game with ninety minutes before the tip off. Ninety minutes, mm -hmm. one half an hour, uh, one hour and a half. I mean, and we're talking about some pre-game interview on the eve of the game, and as it is a huge distraction. Come on now. Come on now. That's only I mean, it's just a things. small detail, but yeah. I mean, it's just not like Euroleague detail uh, things. It's just European and basketball things. And once again, I mean, if we're thinking about some kind of growth, I mean, it should be solved. Anyway, just last thing about uh, Zvezda that I didn't say last uh, last week. Great timing with the coaching change. You know For why? The schedule. Yeah, because usually uh, teams change coaches before a game that's winnable. Mm -hmm. in their opinion yeah, yeah and they did it before the game with us well they won it even though it was a uh, roller coaster ride to say the least i mean they were plus 20 they wasted the lead they were down five or seven in the last quarter and then you know they managed to kick to come back and uh dushko ivanovic made an interesting decision uh it was they were seven seconds if i'm not mistaken left on the shot on the clock in the fourth quarter they are up two and they decide to foul. So basically they're giving an easy chance to tie the game for as well. 
But the catch, the trick was that the um, as well inbounded the ball to Eve Spons. That was a game changer in that game. He was playing great defense, uh, you know, switching all uh, against uh, Zvezda's uh, uh, guards, but uh, he's not a good fr uh, free throw shooter. So he missed both and Zvezda won the game. And that was uh, the deciding factor. And, you know, they're one and zero. Uh, maybe some, maybe the team's morale will mm. uh, will go up. And, um, you know, I want to see Zvezda make some changes and just simply become a better ba better play basketball team. Yeah, now they're playing Alba Berlin away and hosting Maccabi and Virtus Bologna. They have like, yeah, they have a, a nice schedule. It's not only as well, you know, it's a it's a great timing, you know, to, yeah, because, to, to change. Yeah. Because you have now four, these four winnable games that you can do and, and you know, if you wait even more, they might have, have had, a, you know, one win and 10 losses, who knows. Uh, MVP ladder to finish off. Yeah, MVP ladder to finish out. Of course, we were inspired by another remarkable uh, Sasha Vezenkov performance. He's kind of clear front runner. Uh, yeah, at, at the moment, it's an easy choice. Yeah, at the moment, he's. We just did this part of numbers. the part just you know to give a shout out to Sasha Vezenkov. Let's be clear. <laughs> Let's be clear. <laughs> we just thought that okay, we're talking about Vezenkov every single podcast, so we should do something about it. I know from we a haven't talked angle. about we haven't talked about it for for like two pods. Okay, okay. I even sold him on my fantasy team. I had him from the I had him from the first game, and uh, I mean, you sold him before this game. Yeah. Oh my God! I mean, he scored twenty points, had thirteen oh, rebounds, had, four had, assists, and forty-three player index rating on fantasy. That was like win 94, 94, 95 points. So I sold ninety-five points, and my whole team uh, that I that I combined had ninety-five in total. Okay. <laughs> but let's not talk about fantasy. He is a clear. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it never gives satisfaction. Uh, only nerves and stress. Uh, Vezenkov has only two games without 20 points. Only two games. He so six of eight games were at least 20, 20 plus. Yeah, 20 plus oh. games. And he's keeping. He's still keeping the efficiency he had last year. His uh, offensive and defensive ratings are amazing. He's you know nobody seems to have any you know kind of medicine against him whatsoever he's repeating the same things he does every game and to me olympiaco olympiacos is i hope i'm saying it right olympiacos are six and two and um to me he is the clear front front runner who do you have as a number two uh mike james uh because Mostly, I, I I picked players from winning teams. We have Fener, yeah, Olympiacos, Monaco. That's how usually it goes. Winning by a significant significant gap. The problem with Fenerbahce, Fenerbahce is that they have too many contributors without a single key player. Because you might think that yeah. Jonathan Motley is he's I mean he's awesome. I mean. Right now, we just talked with uh, Eric. Uh, he was extra happy after his game. I don't remember which game it was, but Motley was just dominating. I think it was a Red Star game. Red Star game, yeah. He, he was... he, yeah, he avoided the early foul trouble, so it inspired Eric to text me, and he said, hey, man, this guy is going to make the... Whatever it's, whether it's a first or second year league team, but for sure, he's, he's in. We had a bet, right, about it? I... Before the season. Oh, really? A year league rookie to make the first or second... Uh... Or, or maybe it was my predi only my prediction during could one of the be, pods. Could be, could be. That was a good prediction, though. Yeah, that was a good pr prediction because his stat line is really impressive. Uh, he's a top scorer in Fenerbahce with 15.1 points per game on 71% two-point shooting, 5.8 rebounds, 1.86 assists, and 18.2 performance index rating. His team is winning, and he was doing an incredible job. But, you know... He should split that MVP award then with Nikolaitis making some incredible uh, assists. There's also Scotty Wilbekin. There's also Marco Gudrich. I mean, they just have so too many pieces. great players, mm -hmm. too many solid pieces. And oh, wait, you have Mike James at second, right? Yeah, I have Mike James at second. But I put Motley at third because, you know, he's he's exceptional and Fenerbahce is the number one team so far. In yeah, the I, I wrote 
Kalaitis slash Motley. Yeah. But, you know, just like last year, I mean, Mirotic and, <clears throat> and Kalaitis, it was also, you know, co MVP. But I think if, 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 let's say, let's say Fenerbahce uh, is top three after the regular season. Yeah. Who I think Motley should get the, you know, should be considered in the MVP conversation. Obviously, if Vesenkov keeps up with this pace, Olympiakos, Olympiakos is winning. It's out of competition. It's out then. of competition. But at least, you know, in the MVP ladder, Motley should be the one. Uh, do we have any more names? Because I have two more and I want to... By the way, uh, I checked statistically uh, who are considered the best players of the EuroLeague so far. And three steps basket, they have some kind of ranking. They mm. combine a lot of different factors. Uh, Motley has a really, stats, a really great stats. offensive rating and defensive rating. I saw that. Yeah, and he's fifth on this on this list. Mm. They have Alexander uh, Vazenkov uh, on the top. Gabriel Deck, second. Darius Thompson, third. Nikolaitis, fourth, which is interesting. He's even, okay. you know, uh, ahead of Motley. So that's their top five players so far. I mean, I had, uh, yeah, Vizenkov, James as number two, Kalaitis, Motley together. <laughs> I still need some time to decide. Uh, I mean, Vasily Mitic is, he, they have only three wins, but he's and putting up significant numbers. They're still. a losing team so far, man. They will of start, course, in the they, end of the they season, will start they will to win. So, so yeah. I, I still cannot, you know, miss him out of out of top it's five. So early, yeah. And uh, the my fifth name, I'm awarding Keenan Evans with the good start I of Jalgris, and you, he's let's say silent assassin on 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 that team. He's not, uh, you know, for me, he's a silent killer, and he's playing great basketball. Um, great percentages. And he will, you know, remain in the solid area of 15.5 points per game and 4.2 assists because he's the best offensive player in that team. Um, Easily. And since Ignaz Brasdekis is, is still struggling and he's facing some, you know, European basketball challenges, you I could see, see him you being could see, the main you could facilitator. See, you could see Ignaz Brasdekis uh, with the, those problems that Keenan Evans had mm -hmm. in Maccabi last year. Kind of, kind of, kind know, of. So some something similar, you know. It's it's normal what he is going through. He's not. I mean, but as Evans was not that high volume uh, scorer in, yeah, in because, Maccabi because, because Maccabi there was had Vilbekin, James, sure, not only sure. other players. And this is the, basically the conversation between Evans and Brasdakis. There's no other clear option yeah. in Jorgic's offense. So. It's different, yeah, it's different. But, you know, basically it's decision-making, uh, whether that's defense or offense for, for Brasdekis. So, mm. uh, anyway, 52% from the f uh, from two, 44 from three, 88 on free throws, uh, 4.2 assists for Keenan Evans. And, you know, uh, I put him fifth just because Jalger has had a great start. And uh, these, you know, MVP ladders in the start of the season or early, you usually see some kind of name that is probably you you wouldn't think about him mm. but it's just rewarding for a great start uh with a team that wasn't supposed to be here yeah i was thinking about marcus howard but basconia started to you know dropping some games and you know you have to be consistent marcus howard is not consistent at all <laughs> i mean he he had 5 points against villarban 3 points against monaco so so up and down player that you cannot be involved in the MVP conversation if you're not that consistent. Matthias Lasorde is third in uh, efficiency. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, and if we are talking about parties, for Partizan. Pa he's a game changer. But you know, you still, if you are taking one guy from Partizan, it's Kevin Ponder. Mm. Um, There's still yeah, four so. and four. Anyways, nice. It's so nice that we made up this conversation just to show that Vizenkov doesn't have any competition in this MVP race so far, but it's very early, only eight games into the season. And this doubleheader week might change some things. We'll see. Uh, do you have any games you marked on your calendar? I mean, it starts, um, already starts from Monaco and Fenerbahce game on Tuesday, which is just awesome. Maccabi is hosting Olympiacos. That should be a good Milan game. Milan is hosting FS. Barca is hosting Jelko Bradovic and Partizan. And, and we're talking just about the... <laughs> about one these day. games on one day? Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, Tuesday is going to be lit. 
What and about Wednesday? Wednesday, uh, it's you, you have to take a uh, day a break off to watch some football. <laughs> to, no, no, to watch the, all the all those good games that you just mentioned <laughs> and football, of course. Yeah. Uh, then you will have, uh, I would say, Real Madrid Partizan, mm, Milan and Fenerbahce. I mean, sounds great, but <laughs> so far it's not exciting. We'll see. Luavo Cabral, Milano. how he will change the team. <laughs> Who Milan, knows? Milano Fenerbahce should, probably will end like 49, 51, you know? <laughs> no, if this Fenerbahce, they, they will be okay. It will be a higher scoring game. Uh, 49, 51 is hard to be. <laughs> it's hard to see. Yeah. So yeah, another exciting. England just scored. Ooh. Oh, really? The game just started oh, half 35 minutes ago. Okay, who are they playing? Iran. So Wayne Rooney scored, right? <laughs> I know that David Beckham is retired, so... I did want to finish the pod, finish the pod here. <laughs> By the way, there's one interesting topic I didn't discuss, and I'm just hearing uh, behind the scenes that teams are pissed by head coaches taking, I would say, all the spotlight, but at the same time being superstars of the game so far, because I was also unhappy wait, 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 wait. when I saw... Okay, okay, it all started with FS Barca game, Shara's sideline scuffle, a lot of bullshit, press conferences, Ataman making statements, etc. Then the follow-up game was Barna Olympiacos. And once again, we see Andrea Trinchieri, Yorgos Borsokos, mm. you know, making some stuff on the sidelines. And I remember I, I shared it with some, some, some of the people uh, I know in some teams. And we kind of got, you know, we kind of had the same feeling that... Uh, Coaches, they're becoming superstars of the year league, but in some ways that it's not very good. I mean, in, in kind of negative ways. With because, some mini scandals? Uh, yeah, and also like a, like, uh, just, you know... I, their emotions Emotions and over. just being so demanding on everything, basically. For example, I really know some, some, some teams which are don't happy by coaches being so demanding on everything, on roster, on in-season signings, on schedule, on traveling, on charters, on some windows, on, on everything, basically. And coaches are complaining yeah. a lot. I mean, don't get me wrong. I really like a lot of... I'm usually a coaches fan. Uh, I think that their impact in the early is is huge. But I mean, this Dusko Ivanovic thing, for example, of course, it, it's, it was exaggerated, uh, at least uh, the length-wise uh, of, of the practice. Uh, but still, we should kind of, you know, transit into EuroLeague being more players league, I think, and player, players being the main starts uh, of the game. And mm. I mean, I don't know. I just don't like to see this tendency uh, of of coaches becoming so impactful, demanding in all these ways, and I I know and I know that it's kind of you know concerning some some Euroleague clubs as well. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, and I kind of agree with that point. To be honest, that's that's. Uh, I don't have much any, a lot to add about this, but uh, I'm just thinking, you know, if it's you know a problem becoming a problem because of coaches' emotions and because of uh, coaches wanting high standards. And uh, if it's a problem because EuroLeague don't have these standards, EuroLeague teams or organizations and, and you know, EuroLeague as the competition as a whole, but, um, or simply because we don't see uh, so many interesting moments from the game that would capture attention, you know, from from social media or for, or you know, basically from, from the spectator point of view, because that's true, like, we are talking so much about the coaches and uh, not that much about, you know, the, what players have done. Because players, yeah, now, you know, you see this Vesda situation, but it's also connected to, to what happened to the coach. So maybe players are not making, uh, you know, they're not making problems out of all this situation. And coaches find some problems every week, basically, as yeah. we see. I, I remember I talked with somebody from the NBA environment and they told that, I mean, coaches, they don't have that kind of power in that league, which is no, obvious. No, it's because players. The NBA is players. You league. can compare, you know, players' contracts, co coaches' contracts, players' impact and, and stuff. And I think that in the NBA, it's also, you know, it, it's not the way it should be. I mean, the difference, the margin between the 
not just impact they make, but the way they're respected, it's, it's, it's not fair. But now watching it in the EuroLeague, I also think that, you know, this margin is not healthy uh, for the game. Mm. So I don't know, just, just my five cents uh, to end this pod. It would be interesting to hear what, you know, listeners think also. So if you have something to add about this topic, write a comment and because it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting uh, point that you mentioned that, yeah, uh, that with the coaches taking all the attention. Yeah, and after all the, this, what happened last week, you know, it's, it's, it's becoming a topic uh, in, in the EuroLeague. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Let's 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 go to watch some football. Let's let's support uh, Italy and to hope for another successful World Cup run. <laughs> Augusta Shlauskas, Donato Surbanas, uh. we're waiting for your questions this week for our Q and A episode, which some highlights will be available for uh, all the viewers. But the entire episode will be available for BN Plus members, which you can become on basketnews.com/plus. Also. I mean, if you watch the entire episode, please press subscribe. Uh, please subscribe our channel. Pl please uh, press a like button, but because it really helps uh, us to grow. By the way, uh, I approached Nicolaitis, uh, in in I actually catch him getting out of the locker room and going out of the arena. I catch him for the interview, and he said that we are spicy, which is good or bad. What spicy means? I, I, from your action, I see it's not good. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> it's hard to decide, but it's controversial, right? It might be good, it might be bad. Might be Nicolaitis in Barcelona, it might be Nicolaitis in Fenerbahce. <laughs> it might be. I'm keeping it spicy, you know? <laughs> yeah. But at least he stopped uh, and he gave this interview, so it was all good. It was all good. Yeah. That's, That's it. That's all. That's all. See you soon.